Welcome to Fiction Narratives. Chapter 91, Captain Cold How dare you do this do you know who we are Captain Cold found himself tightly bound, suspended upside down in the air by plant tendrils. His movements were restricted, and he couldn't even reach for his pistol, leading to internal frustration. Jude, arms crossed, directed his attention to Captain Cold and remarked, Captain Cold, Wentworth Miller. No, it's a drama, you go by snart, right a gangster, an old friend of the Flash. But your people or the Flash come to your rescue. Snart sneered in response, no, it seems you don't know what we are doing. Amanda Waller, of course, I know that you are the suicide squad formed by the Argus. Listen to your unlucky names. Can suicide be fruitful? You. Since you know that we are members of the Argus, then you'd better get out of it immediately, otherwise, you are the enemy of the whole country, and you will have nowhere to stay. The boomerang captain also shouted. The little spider flicked his wrist, shooting a ball from the spider silk launcher, effectively sealing the boomerang captain. Jude continued, after dealing with Snart, don't use this kind of threatening trick. White gloves like the Suicide Squad are just used to deal with the government's shame. If you fail, do you think Amanda Waller will save you? Even idiots won't have this idea. The official organization hires a group of super criminals to do things. Once such a thing is exposed, the drool of the masses can drown her. For this power freak, she will only be more determined to kill you, not save you, use your brain. As the two bantered, the ice and fire surrounding Venom slowly weakened, and he began to reconsider his stance. Originally filled with thoughts of revenge, Venom, witnessing the defeat of the gang that had bested him earlier, reconsidered his retaliation plans. Opting for silence and reducing his presence seemed a wiser course of action. Unfortunately, Ivy noticed Venom's intention to escape and remarked, that monster is going to run. All right. I'm going to deal with Venom first and then go back to tell Amanda Waller that I have recorded all your actions in high definition. If you don't want me to expose the evidence online, I will let her live a little, otherwise, many people will demand her resignation. Jude approached Venom, stating, Hey. Venom boy, I've been looking for you for a long time. Come here. Venom, wary of the seemingly ordinary Jude, started backing away. Jude proposed a deal suggesting that Venom's arm could become an axe for cooperation. Showing a harmless expression, Jude said, So how about making a deal this time you can listen to my terms first? I only need half of it. Can't your arm become an axe split before it? Then I will take half of it, and you can dispose of the other half by yourself. Anyway, the symbiote has a strong self-healing ability. This small injury shouldn't be a big problem. Think about it, the symbiote slowly continued to retreat, feeling insulted at the moment. Venom let out a roar, attempting to display boldness. What are you doing, dancing and disguising yourself like a Medusa give yourself a minute to think about it. If you agree, hurry up, or I will do it myself, and you will inevitably suffer. Human, don't insult me. Venom opened his mouth wide. Well, it seems that you rejected my proposal. It was not a very smart decision. Boom. Suddenly, Venom smashed the ground with one foot. Jude thought he was going to attack, and the green wall aimed directly at him. However, Venom surprised everyone by slapping the ground. Jude turned and jumped back, anticipating an escape attempt. Oh, I'm not going to use it if you give me a chance. Jude sighed, shook his head, and, blocking his ears with earplugs, threw a small bomb designed to deal with Venom an over-frequency sonic concussion bomb. The bomb exploded a few meters away, emitting an extremely harsh sound wave that made everyone cover their ears. Little Spider swore that the torture of the sound wave was a hundred times more ear-piercing than the unpleasant sound of nails on a chalkboard. The boomerang captain and Shark King, tied up and unable to plug their ears, rolled their eyes and foamed at the mouth. Venom, at the epicenter, twitched painfully as the symbiote began to peel off from Mills Biden's body. Although unable to leave the host completely, many tentacle twigs still clung to Biden's body. Little spider, it's time for you to shoot. Peter flicked his wrist, and the white spider web shot out, sticking directly to Biden's body. Finally, unable to bear the sonic shock, the symbiote was dragged out of the body by the little spider. 
the symbiote retracted, shaking irregularly on the ground. Jude, approaching him, removed his earplugs, threw a glass container on the ground, and said, Go in by yourself, or should I help you in? In addition, I advise you to dispel the idea of possessing me. That is beyond your control. Maybe you will be counter-infected by me. The symbiote continued to twitch for a while and finally seemed to figure it out, creeping into the glass container. What do the four of them do Ivy asked, pointing to the gangsters. Let them go. Sentimental and righteous gangs, are not irredeemably bad guys. Let them return and deliver a message to Amanda Waller. A dot thank you. Shark King growled. You're welcome. So what's wrong with being a shark mascot? Chapter 92, Professor Eobert Thon. In New York, Argus serves as one of the bases. Amanda Waller, with a gloomy expression, addresses the suicide squad of four before her. I really can't imagine how stupid you guys are. Four against one, and you return empty-handed. Even at this moment, I'm contemplating activating the bomb switch and sending all four of you fools to meet God. Captain Cold, angered but helpless, clenches his fists, knowing his life hangs in the balance. Ms. Amanda, the reason for the failed mission is that we were ambushed. We were about to capture the monster. If we are to blame, the Argus's intelligence system also neglected its duty. Are you teaching me how to do things? No, ma'am. I mean, if Argus can find their information, we can retrieve what you want, and we won't fail again. At that moment, the office door knocks, and the secretary enters with a stack of papers. President, apart from Spider-Man, the identities of the other two individuals have been verified. The woman, Ivy Pepper, is the honorary president of the Daily Bugle, currently acting as the president. She is a member of the Wayne Group. She was a victim of the recent Hilton Hotel attack, taken away by SHIELD. The man, Bond Haytham, a Latvian, arrived in the United States two months ago and recently purchased the Pampas Institute. There isn't much information available about him. Jude had erased his old identity during the creation of a new one, leaving few who knew his real name. Even an organization like Sky Show would struggle to unearth his past without extensive investigation. Amanda Waller frowns, a Wayne Group member, a Latvian, and Spider-Man such an unusual combination. How did they come together? The female secretary has no answer, and Shark King humorously suggests, perhaps because they all love pizza. Amanda Waller, losing patience, orders them to leave, threatening dire consequences if they fail to comply. Heatwave suggests stealing back the venom, but Amanda Waller abruptly ends the discussion. Get out. Go to New Mexico, where SHIELD won't bother you. If you try this again, you won't live to regret it, understood. Once the four leave, Amanda instructs, go ask Professor Eobert Thon, only he can handle this matter. After a brief wait, Dr. Eobert Thon, a man with blonde and greasy hair, enters. Amanda Waller, unimpressed with his tardiness, questions his commitment. Waller, I have my own tasks. We are in a cooperative relationship, not a dictatorship. Amanda Waller reminds him of their agreement simulating the Flash's experiment for superpowers. Amanda, you want to force the Flash to hand over technology. I need time for this. Remember our agreement you promised to use official influence to make the Flash cooperate. Amanda Waller defends her position, citing the complexity of the situation in this world. Eobert Thon threatens to find another partner, but Amanda warns him of the challenges with alternatives like S.H.I.E.L.D. Change a partner who do you want to find S.H.I.E.L.D. compared to me, Nick Fury is more of a cannibalistic guy. If you want to return to your world, cooperation with Sky Eye is the best choice. Eobert Thon, realizing the truth in her words, reluctantly agrees. The world is too unfamiliar, and Amanda Waller offers the best chance for him to return to his own reality. His journey through time and space had been chaotic, witnessing unsettling visions. As he came to this world, he encountered characters he had never heard of before Iron Man, Captain America, and Hulk, among others. Eobert Thon, confirming the strangeness of this world, recalls the instability of his superpower during the transition. He had seen disturbing visions and heard cryptic whispers. When the low groan ended, 
he found himself in this unfamiliar world where superheroes and villains from different universes coexisted. Chapter 93, Project Phoenix The arrival of Reverse Lightning was entirely accidental, driven by fear and a desperate hope to return to his world. Unfortunately, without the blessing and protection of his superpowers, he lost that ability. Eobert Thong, seeking refuge in Midtown, discovered that Flashberry Allen had become much stronger than him, surrounded by the Lightning family and a group of friends. Faced with this overwhelming force, Thon had no choice but to retreat. In an attempt to secure funds and materials for re-simulating Allen's fast power experiment, Thon unwittingly targeted the transportation convoy of Argus, leading to his capture. Amanda Waller, along with the Suicide Squad and numerous agents from the Sky Eyes, orchestrated a plan over half a month to trap him. A partnership emerged between Waller and Thon, with Waller offering equipment funds, and Thon providing future technology for Argus, along with assistance in solving complex issues. Although initially hesitant, Thon chose to compromise, acknowledging the familiarity the Argus could provide. Unfamiliar with SHIELD and the complexities it entailed, Thon decided to stay with the Argus, avoiding the interference of nosy heroes who sought like minded villains for alliances. Given the circumstances, it seemed like a prudent stopgap measure. Go ahead, what do I need to do? Thon inquired. Because of that piece of minced meat, it was resurrected. I sent a suicide squad to arrest it, but it was ambushed and eventually taken away by someone else, Waller explained. So you want me to retrieve that lump of minced meat? Swan questioned. Yes, this is the target's intelligence, you can check it out. After a brief examination, Thon threw the intelligence on the table and promptly left the office, prompting Waller to question if he was finished. Of course, the superfast can do everything very fast, Thon replied. Meanwhile, at Haytham Technology Company, after capturing the symbiote, Jude and the little spider returned to the laboratory. The little spider, enthralled by the advanced equipment, recognized the NR2 Cork Analysis Tester, the latest instrument developed by Norwegian Numink. In the black market, as long as you have money, you can buy everything, Jude remarked. Peter, your freshness will be used later, there will be more time in the future, don't talk nonsense now, start the instrument and prepare for slicing. As they prepared to dissect the symbiote, it clung to the glass, resisting its fate. Despite the initial struggle, Jude persuaded the symbiote to cooperate, emphasizing its role in cultivating an army of symbiotes. After placing the symbiote back in the container, Jude instructed Peter to analyze the internal structure of the living tissue and conduct a comprehensive DNA anatomy. The two were busy, with Jude contemplating the next step of the Phoenix project. With the basic work ready, Jude began assembling a human embryo incubator and a sterile petri dish with high oxygen compression. The former aimed to replicate a human female's uterus, optimally utilizing attributes to incubate cloned embryos into babies. The process, much shorter than 10 months, took almost a week for an embryo to grow into a newborn baby. The sterile petri dish, compressed by hyperoxia, allowed the user to control nutrient percentages for accelerated or decelerated growth. As Jude embarked on cloning himself, he inserted a syringe into his arm and began the delicate work. Just as he reached a critical point, a sudden sound startled him, causing the result of all his efforts to falter. Peter, why are you calling Jude inquired. Excitedly, the little spider handed over a stack of papers. Mr. Herbert, for the analysis report you want, everything about the symbiote has been deconstructed. Upon careful examination, Jude discovered a special chain in the symbiote's DNA, designed to neutralize the DNA of other species. This revelation dispelled his doubts, realizing that fusing his genes with the symbiote would not cause rejection, making it a perfect material for the Phoenix Project. Chapter 94, Reverse Flash Nice work, Peter. I did not misunderstand you. I decided to increase your bonus by $10,000 at the end of the year. You can open more rooms with your girlfriend a few more times. Then what you have to do next is to assemble a human embryo incubator and a sterile petri dish with high oxygen compression. What? It's the two instruments next to it. Didn't you look at it when I just assembled it? The little spider shook his head. I'm helping you analyze the structure of the symbiote, sir, that has consumed all my energy. 
Jude smiled and patted him on the shoulder. I know, that's why I assigned you brainless work. Fortunately, I recorded all the process just now. With your IQ, you can learn it by watching the video once. Little Spider sighed helplessly, well, it seems that you have been prepared, but I think this kind of work can be done by recruiting a few graduate students. After all, it is just a mechanical assembly. No, this is a secret job. You must never let a third person know about it. You can do it for a set of $1,000. Little Spider's eyes widened. As long as you successfully assemble a set, I will give you $1,000. Uh, I don't know why, I suddenly feel full of energy. Sent off the little spider, Jude continued his embryonic cell cloning. With the first failure experience, the second time was handy, and ten minutes later, a brand new cell embryo was freshly baked. As long as the embryo is placed in the incubator, a baby version of Jude Herbert will appear in a week, and one will be born exactly like Jude Herbert in more than half a month. Awesome, this is the result I want. Excited, Jude cloned hundreds of embryonic cells in one go, then tore ten tentacles from the symbiont and implanted ten embryonic cells into them. In this case, when these ten special embryonic cells grow up, what he gets is not just the human version of Jude Herbert, but Jude Herbert with the power of a symbiont. Is born with superpowers and speed and has a strong self-healing ability, which is equivalent to a humanoid bulldozer. Just as he wanted to continue cloning, his work was interrupted with a bang. I turned around and saw the little spider hurriedly lifting a petri dish from the ground. Sorry, Mr. Herbert, I didn't mean it, mainly because there is not much space. Chu then noticed that most of the laboratory they were in was already occupied by two kinds of instruments. After a cursory glance, the little spider had completed at least 50 sets. Peter, your efficiency is pretty fast. Little spider smiled shyly, thinking that for $1,000, I could do it until you went bankrupt. Well, let's get here today. We will move these devices to the basement in a while. By the way, are you tired? Little Spider shrugged, it's okay, it's not like a big battle. Very good. It seems that your spider serum is still very desirable. What's that Jude shouted suddenly, pointing behind Peter. The little spider turned around subconsciously and then felt a pain in his shoulder. Turning his head, he saw Jude holding a syringe filled with blood in his hand. Mr. Herbert, what are you doing with my blood? Uh, it's nothing, I mean to make a symbiote battle suit for you, so I need your blood to do research. It won't be good if you have a rejection reaction with the symbiote. Little Spider frowned and reluctantly accepted the answer. Jude smiled and put the syringe in the box for safekeeping. Okay, Peter, don't care about these little things, start moving things, I will help you move them together, how about? He said that he carried an embryo incubator, but his hand slipped, and the incubator fell to the ground. Seeing this, the little spider hurriedly bent over to pick it up. These are the fruits of his hard work a set of $1,000. Mr. Herbert, I can move by myself, you still. Little spider suddenly felt a pain in his ass again, turned his head bitterly, and found that Jude had another syringe filled with blood in his hand was staring a little uncomfortably, Jude pretended to be nonchalant and whistled a few times. Don't look at me like this, Peter, just be prepared. I'm not sure what accident happened. Although he said so, what Jude thought in his heart was to use the characteristics of the symbiote to neutralize DNA to fuse himself, the little spider, and the venom into a trinity. In this case, you can get a super Herbert who is born with Spider-Man ability. Didn't make another brace, so afraid that the little spider would run away, Jude honestly began to move the equipment underground. When the 48 sets were moved, the sky was completely dark. Who, work harder, and we can quickly finish moving one person's suit, and we can call it a day. As a result, he just returned to the laboratory. The little spider stood still for a moment, and the spider in his mind started to alarm strongly. Be careful, Mr. Herbert. As a result, his voice just fell the door of the laboratory opened without wind, and a yellow figure suddenly broke in. At this moment, even if there was an early warning of spider induction, the little spider still did not react, the movement of raising the leg was only half done, and the person flew into the air like being impacted by an external force. 
Jude's end was not much better, he just felt that his body was suddenly hit, the pain had not been transmitted to the brain, and the person had fallen to the ground first. After that, the yellow figure in front of the two of them began to scurry around in the laboratory, as if looking for something. Mr. Herbert, this guy is too fast, I can't see him. The little spider yelled. Not to mention that he can't see it, Jude can't either. After all, the human eye can only see 30 frames per second, and the yellow figure in front of it is like lightning. I am afraid it has broken through thousands or even more. In 10,000 frames, only ghosts can be seen. But although he was fast enough, Jude was not without a choice. He took out the portable micrometer and put it on, adjusted the speed to the maximum, and the picture in front of him began to become clear. I saw a person wearing a yellow battle uniform rummaging through every corner of the laboratory at a very fast speed. His body was shaking at high speed, as if it were teleporting every moment. It wasn't until the yellow figure saw the container containing the symbiont that his movement speed slowed down, and then, looking back at Jude and the little spider, the corners of his mouth rose slightly, the speed increased again, and he disappeared instantly. The whole process only lasted less than 10 seconds, but when the yellow figure left, the laboratory was like a hurricane, and various equipment parts were scattered on the ground. He. Mr. Herbert, this guy is so frightening fast, do you know him? Of course, he's reverse flash. Chapter 95, R18 I think. Jude slowly set aside the microscopic measuring instrument, his gaze fixed on the door with solemnity. If he read correctly, the yellow figure he just encountered was none other than the reverse flash, Eobert Thon. However, the situation seemed perplexing. Reverse Flash hailed from the 25th century and was known as one of Flash's old adversaries. Why would he assist Argus in dealing with him this discrepancy puzzle Jude? The little spider, recovering from the ground, inquired with a hint of dread, Mr. Herbert, was the yellow figure you mentioned the Reverse Flash? That's correct. Similar to the Flash, he possesses super speed abilities. You should have realized it at that moment, Jude replied. Um, even my spider sense didn't have time to react. Fortunately, he was merely searching for something and not intending harm, otherwise, we could have been in serious trouble. Observing the disarray in the laboratory, Jude commented, Peter, tidy up. We're done for today. You can head home. Glancing at the abandoned symbiote on the shelf, Jude showed little concern. Having already removed numerous tentacles in advance, he could replicate the symbiote, albeit with a slightly extended time frame. The real concern lay with the Argus. Amanda Waller seemed to be directing her focus on him. Considering Waller's ruthless personality, Jude realized he needed to be prepared to take preemptive actions when necessary. At that moment, Jude's phone rang, and upon answering, he found Ivy on the other end. Jude, I just got a call from Alfred. It seems Argus intends to exert pressure on Wayne Group. Alfred advises us not to antagonize this organization, let alone expose the video online. It's as if nothing happened. After a moment of contemplation, Jude responded, understood. The laboratory was attacked, and the symbiote was stolen. It appears that the Argus is involved in everything. Did you and Peter get hurt? Ivy inquired anxiously. No. The attackers were solely interested in the symbiote and showed no intention of causing harm. However, it indicates they have reservations and don't want to escalate matters. Concerning the video, Ivy hesitated before asking, what about the video? Keep it for now, don't release it. Consider the matter closed, Jude advised. Then our efforts were in vain, Ivy remarked. Jude chuckled, I had a backup plan in place, so let them be prepared for a surprise. After tidying up the laboratory, the little spider departed, leaving Jude to contemplate how to deal with reverse flash. Given Amanda Waller's vengeful nature, retaliation seemed inevitable. However, Jude considered Waller's agents mere pawns, and the real threat was reverse flash. Although uncertain if Amanda possessed other cards, Jude felt confident in his ability to counteract extremely fast opponents. Reflecting on the speedsters, Jude acknowledged their awe-inspiring capabilities but concluded that their real danger lay in sneak attacks. Frontal combat, he believed, would be simpler to handle. Considering countermeasures, Jude entertained various options, 
from simple glass ball tactics to more complex methods like the ice used by the cold captain. He mused on creating glue or manipulating gravity fields, confident in his ability to handle extremely fast opponents. One concern lingered the speedster's lethal technique of vibrating molecules at high speed to insert hands into victims' bodies. As he contemplated this, Jude looked down at his chest. Returning to the hotel, Jude found it was already early morning. Despite a day of intense activity, he felt invigorated rather than fatigued. As he wiped away sweat, Jude decided to grab some breakfast. Just as he was changing, Ivy entered the room, rubbing her eyes. Observing Jude's naked form, Ivy nonchalantly asked, Did you not come back last night? No, I was doing some research to prepare for potential dangers. Argus Ivy inquired. It's one of them, but the real threat lies beyond the sky and in other dimensions. Although not fully understanding, Ivy acknowledged, It sounds impressive. I thought you were out having fun. Jude frowned, examining himself in the mirror and then glancing at Ivy in her nightgown. Want to have some fun he suggested. Ivy, momentarily surprised, shrugged, sure, why not? The two embraced, and after a passionate moment, Ivy's sleepy eyes transformed with newfound energy. So, you enjoy the excitement in front of the mirror Ivy teased. Of course, and many other ways too. The following 20,000 words are omitted. As the clock struck eight, Ivy stood up. Time for round two. Don't you have work Jude questioned. I'm the president, who dares to control me I'm taking the lead this time. With that, she moved closer. Jude felt the heat, and only one thought remained in his mind. Can you resist the skill of 20 years? Chapter 96, Dyson Sphere Every now and then I have the feeling I've totally lost my mind. It's a great feeling. Nightwing time passed, and another week slipped by without any trouble from Argus. Just as Jude had anticipated, Amanda Waller refrained from pushing the boundaries too far, taking into account the concerns of the Wayne group. Moreover, her operatives had managed to secure the symbiote first. Despite the unexpected interruption during the encounter, Jude and the others successfully retrieved their belongings, giving Amanda Waller's organization some pause. She had, in a way, shown a measure of respect to Bruce Wayne. Amanda Waller's perspective dictated that it was best to let things lie. Pretend as though nothing had happened and move forward. Each party would follow their own path, ignoring the recent events. However, she made it clear that if the Wayne group ever faltered in the future, she wouldn't hesitate to revisit and settle old scores. The names of those who had crossed her would be meticulously recorded in her diary. The Argus remained silent, and Shield was preoccupied with other matters, leaving Jude with a relatively clear week. In moments of idleness, he summoned the little spiders. At that particular juncture, over a hundred sets of cloned human training suits were stored in the basement. This abundance was a result of exhausting all the basic parts available. Assembling more sets would be impossible unless Jude personally crafted each component, a task deemed impractical. Why not indulge in leisurely activities like watching TV and enjoying a drink during this downtime Jude decided to invest the remaining funds to order a new batch of goods, scheduled for delivery in the near future. In the basement of Pampa's Institute, Jude strolled through rows of sterile petri dishes enveloped in high-oxygen environments, inspecting the progress of the past week's work. Each petri dish held an identical baby Jude, just born from the incubator. With adjustments to the nutrient ratio, these clones would be ready to grow in a few days. In total, there were 111 clones in the field. A hundred were cloned from Jude's human embryos, ensuring a 100% human composition without any additives. The remaining nine were the products of symbiote fusion. Originally ten, one clone was lost due to the sudden appearance of reverse lightning, who snatched away the symbiote. Jude had to remove the symbionts from a cloned embryo and use the stripped symbionts to replicate new ones for the growth to continue. Among the remaining two clones, one incorporated the little spider gene, destined to possess all the abilities of a little spider the Spider-Man version of Jude Herbert. The last clone incorporated the Ivy gene, and upon maturation, it would become the plant Ivy version of Jude Herbert. This marked only the beginning of the Phoenix plan, with potential expansions in the future. A thought crossed Jude's mind an ambitious plan to amass an army of superpowers, combining different superpower genes into a powerful stitched version of himself. 
Examples included the Kryptonian Gamma Giant by merging genes of Superman and the Hulk, or the addition of Thanos gene resulting in the Krypton Titan Gamma Giant. Jude envisioned creating an ultimate being with physical and magical resistance, akin to Shula in Dragon Ball. Satisfied with his contemplation, Jude admired the baby versions of himself and proceeded to extract his memory using an instrument resembling an octopus, known as a memory radiation device. The next step was to infuse these memories into the clones to prevent them from becoming ignorant. After completing this critical step, Jude closed the door to the underground laboratory. As he approached, the little spider expressed concern, Hey, Mr. Herbert, we're running out of time. We're fighting Iron Man in a few days. Aren't you worried at all? Jude responded with calm assurance, Young man, you must do things calmly. Who said there's no time we still have five full days, more than enough, and still very rich. Mr. Herbert, are you crazy I said five days, not five years. Well, Peter, don't complain. The new parts have just arrived. Now, let's start work. Jude proceeded to unveil the design of the battle armor, noticeably distinct from Iron Man's sleek design. If Tony Stark's armor was streamlined for both beauty and practicality, Jude's design prioritized ruggedness and combat efficiency, resembling that of a cowboy. Peter, you're a high-achieving student in physics and engineering. The design drawings are provided, let's start making them. The little spider, skeptical about the unfamiliar techniques, questioned the feasibility. Jude dismissed his concerns and revealed a machine from the storage room the FWGK-3 power propulsion device he had successfully developed. As the little spider marveled, Jude directed him to retrieve various components, assuring him that everything he needed was in the storage room. The little spider, relieved but curious, asked, Uh, so you have done everything. Jude, leaning against the experiment table, took a long drink and replied, Of course. Do you want me to count on you you have to be self-aware, Peter. Although the little spider was initially ridiculed, he felt relieved and proceeded to gather mechanical parts. Picking up a palm-sized ball, he inquired, What is this, Mr. Herbert? Jude answered, The core energy device of the battle armor, you can also call it another name the Dyson Sphere. Chapter 97, Deadpool Returns You might be wondering why the red suit. Well, that's so bad guys don't see me bleed. Deadpool the so-called Dyson Sphere, in layman's terms, is a giant man-made energy harvesting and transforming device whose main function is to surround the star and obtain most or all of its output energy. The energy of a star is mainly transmitted through radiation, Jude explained, pointing at the holographic image of a star. Each light wave contains huge energy, but when this light wave reaches Earth, we can only harness a tiny fraction. Peter, the little spider, furrowed his brows in curiosity, why is that? Jude continued, on one hand, it's due to the long distance and waste in the transmission process. On the other hand, our technology isn't advanced enough to capture all that energy. We're talking about one billionth of the star's energy. The Dyson Sphere wraps the star at a close distance, Jude continued, gesturing toward the schematics. When the star's radiation leaks out, we intercept it and convert it into usable energy, maximizing our energy utilization. Jude dismissed the idea of creating a full-scale Dyson Sphere around the Sun. We don't have the time or resources for that. Instead, we'll focus on supplying energy to the battle armor. This miniature Dyson Sphere will do the trick. Peter held the Dyson Sphere in his palm, examining it closely. It's fascinating, but I don't get all of it. Learning is a long process, Peter, Jude reassured him. You don't need to understand everything now. Just assemble these components according to the design drawings. Can you do that? I think so, Peter nodded. I'll learn a lot in the process. Great, get to work then. Jude encouraged him. As they waited for Deadpool's return, Jude decided to contact the bar. Sally, it's me, Jude said when Sally picked up the phone. The voice on the other end hesitated before responding, Look, we had a good time, but it's just that. It's impossible for us. Let's move on, bye. Jude baffled, tried again, wait, don't hang up. This is Jude Herbert. Is Wade Wilson back? The response was unexpected, 
the guy who drank the death rose in one gulp I thought you were the one who fought with me yesterday. Fencing, right Jude clarified. Yeah, that guy. Are you interested? Stop that topic, Jude chuckled. I want to know if Deadpool is back. He has, made a fortune, and seems uninterested in taking up tasks. How much did he earn on the last task? Two million dollars, enough for a month of enjoyment. Only two million tell him to come to Pampas Technology, now renamed Haytham Technology. Remuneration is 10 million US dollars today. Deduct 1 million for each day of delay. Got it? Are you kidding me? Would anyone joke with killers? Okay, I'll make sure he's there soon. Jude sighed, looking at Peter, this is the power of capital, the taste of money, it's wonderful. Half an hour later, a taxi arrived at the institute. Deadpool, true to his style, tossed dollars in the air. Mr. Your money has fallen, Deadpool announced, squeezing the driver's face. A tip for you, Lord Deadpool is soon becoming a multi-millionaire, ha ha ha. As the banter continued, security guards approached to stop Deadpool. That drag freak, stop, this is not where you should be. A security guard shouted. The cross-dress freak oh, you mean yourself, Deadpool retorted, pointing. We're in a comic movie world. Superheroes like me are mainstream, and maybe supervillains should be added. And do you know what an alien is it's a guy wearing a normal work uniform like you, you are the transvestites. And I, I'm a figure at the top of the popular list all year round. Deadpool turned to the empty space next to him, asking, are you right? Fuck dude, come here at the gate, there is a transvestite lunatic who is making trouble. He must be driven away, otherwise, we will not be able to keep our job, the security guard radioed. At that moment, a small drone scanned Deadpool's face, announcing, Identity verification is complete, allow entry. Deadpool grinned, raised his fist to the security guard, bounced, and followed the drone into the institute. Chapter 98, The Death Stroke So, you're my employer Deadpool asked as he sprawled in the office, feet on the table, hands behind his head, and inquired awkwardly. Wade Wilson, codenamed Deadpool, is a renowned figure in the mercenary world. I've been searching for you for quite some time, and today, we finally met, Jude replied. Heh, this uncle is already famous. I didn't think I'd become so popular. Those story writers really boosted my reputation, Deadpool remarked, gesturing dramatically. Thanks. I'll be a guest sometime, the kind without a knife. Observing Deadpool's peculiar behavior, Jude couldn't help but feel intrigued. This style, breaking the fourth wall, indicated that Deadpool possessed such abilities in this world. Feigning suspicion, Jude asked, Wait, who are you talking to? Deadpool shrugged, who knows could be a cartoonist, a screenwriter, or some online writer. Lately, I've been showing up in their stories more and more. They've made me cheap. Jude, or is it Jude Law, Jude Cow, Jude Sack whatever. This is a virtual world, and we're just characters. They might be giving Deadpool uncle a new plot. They always throw in weird things. I thought they'd make me a black man. Then they could have a black man fuck my ass. Perfect if he's transgender. If I were a fat, ugly, gay, depressed, ethnic minority with AIDS, that'd be truly invulnerable, right Deadpool said with a grin. Come on, give a high five, brother. I feel the resonance from the soul, he added, raising his hand. Ignoring the high five, Deadpool looked up at the sky and shouted, you guys finally gave Deadpool uncle a reliable partner. Remember to keep it? I don't like Ganglish's dullness, so send him away. Then he whispered, Black Panther is a bad movie. Jude refrained from high-fiving Deadpool, having noticed the multiple times Deadpool touched his ass during the conversation. All right, Wade. Put away your special abilities. I heard you'd do anything for money. We can negotiate a deal, a mission, Jude explained. Excitedly, Deadpool stood up, raised his hands, and exclaimed, Great. I'm here for this. A task worth ten million dollars I've never turned one down. Tell me already. I can't wait to stand on the Statue of Liberty and throw money, then look at the money pickers below and shout, This is freedom, America. 
Deadpool continued in his eccentric manner. It's nothing extreme. Maybe a tube of blood or a few pieces of meat. It won't harm your life, you have strong self-healing abilities, don't you Jude reassured him. Think about it, wait, a few days of boredom, a bit of flesh and blood, and you get ten million dollars. Ninety-nine percent of people would agree, it's too cost-effective, Jude reasoned. Deadpool, with the hand on his chin and the other on his ass, pretended to contemplate. Jude, prepared for any response, was ready to use coercive measures if necessary. Um, I agree, this uncle agrees. Deadpool exclaimed, Jude, relieved, smiled, a wise choice. The time is tentatively set for one week. For each day's extension, I'll pay you an extra one million dollars. In an unexpected move, Deadpool knelt and hugged Jude's thighs, crying out emotionally, Boss, I've been looking for someone like you all my life. I'm willing to pack myself and sell to you. If that's not enough, my cousin can also be yours. My ass is at your service anytime. If that's not enough, add my cousin, Steel Man, Bullet, or anyone's ass, like Ryan Reynolds, Brad Pitt, and the rest. Jude, disturbed by Deadpool's display, swiftly moved his arm, causing a blast that shattered the office wall. Deadpool stood up, seemingly unscathed. Isn't my proposal great my sugar daddy? Deadpool declared, flashing the middle fingers of his hands. Even the unscrupulous Jude felt defeated by Deadpool's audacious behavior. This guy was the embodiment of irreverence, principles and integrity were up for sale. Shut your mouth. Come with me, Jude ordered, leading Deadpool out of the office. Little spider trailed behind. Look at me, baby. Do I look like a bunny I'm the kind of guy who lays on the bed and pushes his butt? I'll give you the position of attack, Deadpool suggested. We could call my cousin and have a fuck trip. Thinking about it is exciting. We can work together to create a blockbuster, Deadpool continued, unabated. Ignoring him, Jude asked, your cousin seems important to you. Who is he? Of course, he brought me into the mercenary world, and he's quite famous. His codename is something you must have heard of, the Deathstroke. Chapter 99, Slade Wilson is Deadpool's cousin. The Deathstroke's name is Slade Wilson, he is Deadpool's cousin, and it's no joke. Initially, DC created the villain Deathstroke, who, due to his unique style and super combat powers, even posed a threat to Batman, Flash, and Superman, causing his popularity to skyrocket. Marvel naturally followed suit, imitating Deathstroke's design to create Deadpool. However, the two characters are opposites. In their respective universes, Deathstroke has a cousin named Wade Wilson, and Deadpool has a cousin named Slade Wilson. This is a tacit linkage between the two comic book companies. However, in this universe, Deadpool and Deathstroke have become true cousins. Jude took Deadpool down the elevator and soon arrived at the intersection in the basement. Wow, why are we going to the basement I've seen this kind of movie? Serious scientists conduct experiments underground. Only those Frankenstein keen on human anatomy choose the basement. Suddenly, I feel so scared, Deadpool said, patting her chest. Jude's pupils were scanned at the entrance, and a mechanical voice sounded, verification passed, entry allowed. He patted Deadpool on the shoulder and smiled. Movies are all tricks. I'm a serious scientist, licensed and recognized by the Ministry of Commerce, so don't worry. But Deadpool exaggeratedly hugged his head. Really that's a horror story? Everyone knows that the American business department, as long as you give them money, even if you're selling whites to blacks, the green light will be on. The basement door opened, and Deadpool followed Jude. Passing by rows of cloned babies, Deadpool became cautious, noticing something wrong. That. Chew. Chew. Jude Herbert. Yes, I remember clearly, Mr. Jude Law. Can I ask what are these glass barrels? Myself. What? I said that it contained myself, and it's a clone of me. Don't be surprised, Wade. If you don't believe it, you can take a closer look, and you will find that every baby looks the same. Deadpool approached and leaned on the glass, observing. When he realized that every baby looked identical, his suspense grew. Mr. Jude Law, 
there are hundreds of glass jars here, meaning there will be hundreds of you. You don't want to play a hundred person war. If you do this, let alone me, even with my cousin, it would be overwhelming. Of course, if you are willing to add money, say another 10 million US dollars, even if it's mail to mail, I am willing to fuck the mail. However, despite Deadpool's banter, his vigilance increased. The glass pillars reminded him of the Weapon X plan. Back then, the glass pillars were filled with mutants, and now they were filled with babies. Who knew the truth he wasn't a scientist. After the incubation room, Jude took Deadpool deeper into the laboratory. Lie down on that bed, I want to do a full body check on you first. Deadpool screamed in excitement and began to untie his belt. No, it doesn't need to be this way, well, I have seen it. Ignoring Deadpool's antics, Jude pointed various experimental instruments at him and started scanning. A few minutes later, the first result report showed that everything was normal, at least on the surface, there was nothing special. Very well, next I will draw your blood and also some subcutaneous tissue, don't resist, wait. Really like this. Deadpool picked up the syringe and gave himself a shot. He then took out a scalpel and stabbed his lower body, holding a few small particles in his hands and handing them to Jude. What is this? My hemorrhoids, boss. Take it away, stay away from me, you perverted guy, no wonder so many people hate you, it seems that I need some coercive measures to shut you up. Jude snapped his fingers, and several electronic iron hoops burst out, wrapping around Deadpool's limbs and neck. Do you want to play SM, boss I didn't expect you to be in the alphabet circle, 50 degrees black, haha, <laughs> but you need to add money to play like this. <laughs> Before Deadpool could finish his words, the electronic iron hoop sent a strong electric current through his body. I finally shut him up. I thought Rick and Morty were dirty enough, but you, as a scientist, are even better. On the road to the 19th ban on the yellow storm, it's as unmatched as driving a rocket. Seeing Deadpool finally calm down, Jude pointed to his chest. The ceiling opened, a laser cutter extended, Deadpool's chest was cut open, and Jude removed his internal organs, placing some flesh and blood on the HX-63 scanning analyzer. This high-tech instrument is used to scan human internal organs to search for hidden genes. This process would take a while. When Jude turned around to check on Deadpool, he saw that his chest began to heal automatically, the granules growing quickly. Is it a self-healing ability it's really strong? Why did I faint suddenly Deadpool woke up after a few minutes, still dizzy? Ignoring him, Jude pointed a drill-like instrument at Deadpool's eyeball, and a saw-like object approached his scalp. Jude took out a tool with a long white tube from the toolbox, patted Deadpool's face, and smiled. This is for brain extraction. I want to see if your brain is different from ordinary people, otherwise, why can you break the fourth wall? Chapter 100, X Gene One day passed quickly. Jude conducted various experiments on Deadpool, but the final result was, without exception, nothing special. However, a set of gene chains different from those of ordinary people was detected. Observing the analysis report, Jude muttered to himself, is this the X gene with this thing, ordinary people can become mutants and do interesting things. According to Jude's understanding, mutants did not evolve naturally but were the result of external interference. This force that interferes with human evolution is the celestial group. The celestial group, the earliest race born in the Marvel Universe, is known for its enormous size, with a height of 3 to 400 meters, and their bodies wrapped in advanced mecha shells. Their true forms remain unseen. The most reliable description of the celestial group is that they are high-energy life forms, composed of dark matter, dark energy, and the collision energy between positive and negative matter. They stand on the mountaintop, passing judgment on other races and conducting experiments on various planets. Every so often, they return to the planet being tested, secretly observing the progress of the planet's civilization. If the progress meets their expectations, they consider the experiment successful and silently withdraw. However, if the development does not meet their expectations, the consequences are simple, destruction. Jude preserved the truncated X gene chain for future experiments. When the new equipment is assembled, he plans to try creating a mutant version of the clone. As for Deadpool, 
After a day of experimentation, Jude saw dissatisfaction and pain in his eyes. After all, their eyeballs were poached alive, their brains were directly extracted, and even the eggs were cut off. One would be very dissatisfied, even for ten million dollars. Looking at the row of Deadpool parts on the shelf, Jude nodded in satisfaction. Observing the still immobile Deadpool, Jude said, Wade, don't look at me with those eyes, think about the ten million dollars, you'll have a lot of money right away, you should be thankful. Well, to prevent you from running around, I will not let you out. Tomorrow, we will continue to experiment with consciousness and thinking. I must explore your thoughts in depth to determine what I want to know. After speaking, he snapped his fingers and said, freeze him to prevent him from running around. As Jude reached the door, he stopped again, saying, forget it, leave him with a head, at least let his mouth speak, otherwise, he will be stunned. A thawing ray hit Deadpool's head, and Jude laughed and said, thank me, wait. Leaving the basement, Jude noticed that it was already dark outside. The managers had already left work, and only the security guards remained. The laboratory light is still on, and the little spider hasn't left yet. Because of the original promise, Peter Parker has always maintained regular working hours, but today he took the initiative to stay overtime, which is not surprising. Jude pushed open the door of the laboratory and saw the little spider burying his head in a pile of parts, next to the assembled limbs of the armor. Peter, you are still working hard. The work attitude is worthy of recognition. If you continue like this, you will be able to catch up with me in a thousand years. The little spider raised his head from the parts, covered with oily hands. Mr. Herbert, it's too difficult. Even with the design drawings, I still find it too complicated. Sorry, it took me a day to assemble these. You must be disappointed. Jude walked to the refrigerator. Yes, his laboratory was unique. It had a refrigerator. He opened the refrigerator door and asked, What do you want to drink? I declare in advance that I don't have any juice here. Uh, instead of drinking at this time, you might as well teach me quickly, time is running out. Well, then I will decide for you, the rum is ready. Uh, brandy, at least made from grapes. Jude took out a bottle of brandy and threw it over. Next. A spider thread shot out stuck the bottle accurately, and pulled it into the hand. Is there a cup Mr. Herbert? Jude unscrewed the lid of the vodka and gulped down half of the bottle. Hi, Peter, if it were in the 18th century, your request would be laughed at as an idiot, okay by man, like me. After Jude finished speaking, he bore the remaining half of the bottle, and the little spider may have lost his energy at work. In a melancholy mood, he also learned from Jude to drink the half bottle directly. Cough. 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 In an instant, the little spider's tears almost burst out. Jude laughed and slapped him on the back, that's it, Peter, you finally have a man's spirit. Do you know why your girlfriend is always pried away by others it's because you lack the man's spirit. The little spider looked embarrassed. Mr. Herbert, I didn't expect you to also know about the things between Mary Jane, Harry, and me. Of course, no one in the world knows. I am even more surprised that you can get along with the two of them calmly. Do you want to have a threesome? There was a look of disgust on Little Spider's face. You are so sick, Mr. Herbert. Ha <laughs> ha. So why are you bisexual don't Mary Jane and Harry want to give up? Hey, I feel more sick. The two chatted for a while, but the Little Spider was soon drunk, and he was a naive kid. Jude wanted to leave him in the laboratory, but just a few steps away, the phone rang, and the caller ID said, Aunt May. After hesitating, Jude still connected. Hello madam, I'm Jude Herbert, Peter's boss. The phone froze for a while, and then an old and kind voice said, Hello, sir, what about Peter why doesn't he answer the phone? Uh, he was drunk, he was a bit busy at work today, so we had some leisure time after getting off work. Let me know where the address is, and I'll take him home. Don't bother sir, let me pick him up. Jude certainly couldn't let this nearly 70 year old lady run over in the middle of the night. After asking for the address, he carried the little spider in the car and went straight to the destination.